Hi everybody and uh, good morning to you on the Pacific Coast, uh, good afternoon if you're on the Eastern Seaboard, uh, good evening if you're in Europe and uh, if we have anybody attending from Asia, thank you very much for staying up so late. Uh, now, welcome to today's webinar, uh, which is uh, Grow Your Own Green Oil Field. Uh, we conduct these webinars every second, uh, well, I'm sorry, every the uh, Jotrofa ones are every second Thursday, but we have webinars every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern, and they last approximately 30 to 40 minutes, and you'd be glad to know that we try to begin and end promptly. You can register for our webinars on the front page of our website. If you go to www.costarikainvest.ie, you can always find out what we've got uh, coming up on the front page of the website. Now, we do record the webinars, and the recordings are available in the free downloads and media area of the website, as you can see it there on the screen. Just go into that area, and you can access all previous uh, recordings. Now, for those of you attending a webinar for the first time, you'll see a little control panel on the right-hand side of your screen, and there's an area in that that you can type in questions. And what I always suggest to people is that you, if you have any questions uh, that uh, pop into your mind in, during the course of the webinar, feel free to type them in there. We will have a short question and answer session at the end of the webinar, and we'll get to as many of those questions as we possibly can. So today, what are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to talk about a secret that Texan oil men already know, and that is that an oil field is a great investment, and it provides regular income and increasing prices. But today we're going to tell you a little more. We're going to tell you about an opportunity that you probably don't know so much about, and that's that a green oil field is an even better investment. It's a one-of-a-kind opportunity, and we have a very limited inventory in our current project. Now, what can you what can you expect to find out in today's webinar? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about Costa Rica, about real estate in Costa Rica, about real estate purchase and ownership in Costa Rica. We are, of course, going to talk extensively about biofuels, and we're going to talk about this limited launch offer that we have. And also, we have a bonus uh, for those of you who are on this webinar here today, only for those of you who are attending live, um, and we will mention that bonus at the end of the webinar. First of all, a little background on me. Uh, my name is James Cahill, and I'm a director of Costa Rica Invest. We've been involved in ecological hybrid investments and development opportunities for the past four years. The companies that we choose to work with all have a very high level of expertise and success. We're sticklers for detail, and we always do a very thorough due diligence on any company before we agree to work with them. The criteria we use when choosing a company or project to work with are that we like projects which include development land, that combine it with agriculture and commodities that are green and eco-friendly, sustainable. And we only work, as I mentioned, with high-quality, reputable companies that have a strong record, a strong track record, and companies that we enjoy working with. In particular, we're very fond of opportunities that cater for all types of investors, from the very largest right down to the very smallest. And uh, we only look at opportunities in Costa Rica, which, of course, have high potential yields for our clients. Now, we've all discovered to our cost that many of the traditional investment opportunities that we have invested in and uh, traditionally looked at have proved very lacking. And indeed, some of those people that we put our trust in have proved similarly lacking. Now, I know I've certainly discovered this to my cost, and those bank shares that uh, I invested in in Ireland certainly don't look very attractive now, and particularly today, as uh, the banks have just undergone another stress test and announced that they need another 24 billion euros. Um, it used to be that a million seemed like a lot of money. Now a billion seems, uh, unless you owe many billions, uh, you don't seem to have a lot of money. But the bottom line is, of course, that no investment advisor cares as much about your money uh, as you do, or is as engaged at making it grow. But if you had access to an investment which combined various asset classes, the first of which doubles in value every 10 years, the second asset Goldman Sachs says is akin, if you invest in it, it's akin to turning the clock back to the 1990s and investing in the PC revolution. The next asset uh, can multiply by 100% per year depending on circumstance, but historically see, has seen average per annum returns of 20%. And together, conservative, conservatively, these asset classes combine to give a 38.2% simple interest return yearly or a 382% return on investment over 10 years. 
So if you were able to take charge of your future and invest in these real assets, would they be of interest? Well, what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about real assets that are in your name and we're talking about our renewable energy farms. Now, many of you on the call here today are familiar with Costa Rica, but I will give you a very quick background. So, where is it? Well, Costa Rica is in Central America. It is the oldest, dimension, uh, the oldest and most stable democracy in Central and Southern America. With more teachers than policemen, it has a literacy rate of 96%. And this year, they're going to spend more than 25% of their entire national budget on education. It has a fantastic climate, and people in Costa Rica live longer than most other places in the Western Hemisphere, with an average age of 79 years. Costa Rica contains over 5% of the world's, the world's biodiversity. And it's the country that practically invented ecotourism, and it ranks really highly in the number of pools. They're now ranked third in the world in, in terms of environmental performance, and that study is carried out every two years by Yale University, and we're expecting the results of this year's study to be out shortly. Now, Costa Rica intends to be number one. Four years ago, they were number five. Two years ago, they were number three. Let's see how they do this year. Costa Rica is ranked number one in the world in the Happy Planet Index. This compares the ecological footprint of a nation to its happiness. So the bottom line with Costa Rica is that the people are very happy and they don't do much damage to the environment. That study is carried out every year by the New Economics Research Foundation. Costa Rica is the seventh most politically and socially stable country on the planet. And that's a fact that often shocks people. When you say that the seventh most politically and socially stable country in the world is located in Central America, most people just simply don't believe it. But it is, and that country is Costa Rica. Costa Rica is also the most prosperous country in, in Latin America, and that study is carried out every year by the Legatum Prosperity Index. Costa Rica has preserved more than 25% of its surface areas, natural park and forest reserve, and it's never going to be developed. They plan to be carbon neutral as a nation by 2021, and more than 95% of their energy requirements come from renewable resources, wind, water, and geothermal power. So Costa Rica is a very small country, but they have very big goals. They plan, as I mentioned, to be carbon neutral as a nation by 2021, and to do that, they're using a number of different channels, but one of which is that they are planting lots of trees, Last year, they planted more than 7 million trees. That's more per head of population than anywhere else in the world. But to achieve this goal of carbon neutrality, they're going to have to plant more trees. They're going to have to preserve more land. And that's going to add to the value of existing development land. Now, Costa Rica is a very attractive tourist destination, and the tourism industry is worth over $2 billion per year to Costa Rica, and they intend to grow that further. At the beginning of last year, their numbers were up 11.5% compared to 2009, and that trend continued throughout, throughout the year. And over the year as a whole, they, um, they increased tourist numbers by 10.5% in comparison to 2009. But Costa Rica is not interested in the one-off visitor. They want people to come again and again, and preferably own a home in Costa Rica, and spend those hard-earned dollars in Costa Rica rather than in other destinations. To do this, they've made the process of emigrating to Costa Rica very straightforward, and you and I have the same land and property ownership rights as a Costa Rican citizen, and that's enshrined in their constitution. In fact, they've made the process so easy that more than 1% of the population is already North Ameri American expatriates and retirees. And why are they looking to Costa Rica? Well, they're looking for a lower cost of living, safety, security, great health care, and a fantastic climate. The cost of living in Costa Rica is about 50% of the cost of living in the USA, and healthcare is a fraction of the price. So you can imagine living in a beautiful climate in a safe place with great healthcare for a fraction of your current cost of living. But Costa Rica is also looking elsewhere to generate revenue, and it's looking to high-tech industry, a combination of lucrative tax breaks, a highly educated workforce, and low labor costs has successfully attracted many, many multinationals. So Costa Rica is very business friendly, with huge eco aspirations. It's stable, it's safe, with excellent health care. Let's talk a little bit about the economy of Costa Rica. Was Costa Rica affected by the recent global economic crisis? Well, of course it was. Where wasn't? But they put IMF funding in place. They prepared in case they needed uh, some assistance. And in fact, they never needed to use the IMF funding. But the IMF 
issued a very, very strong report on Costa Rica back in 2010, highlighting that economic growth rose in the second half of 2009 and remained strong in the first quarter of 2010, and they stated that economic recovery in Costa Rica is firmly underway. And it was. Exports have increased throughout the year, and in fact, the economy grew as a whole by 4.5% last year, and Reuters is predicting a 5% growth for this year. Now, let's talk a little bit about land in Costa Rica. Costa Rican land prices have seen spectacular increases over the last number of years, and in some areas, properties have gone up by hundreds, if not thousands of percent. But there are two very big drivers which are going to affect land prices in the short to medium term in Costa Rica. The first of which is baby boomers. Over 100 million baby boomers are going to retire over the next decade. Now, some estimates suggest that up to 10% would seek to retire abroad. And when they look to retire abroad, what will they be looking for? Will they be looking for safety, security, good climate, quality health care, and a lower cost of living? Costa Rica ticks all of these boxes. Now, of course, Costa Rica couldn't possibly take 10 million uh, retirees. They only have a population of 4 million right now. But a significant number will and are right now looking at Costa Rica. And as a demographic, these baby boomers have more money than any other demographic ever had in history. The second big driver for land price growth is Costa Rica's eco plans. Do you remember I mentioned they plan to be carbon neutral as a nation by 2021 and the fact that 25% is already zoned as natural park and forest reserve not to be developed? Well, the aspiration to be carbon neutral means they need to plant more trees and that's a process that's already underway and they need to preserve more land to plant those trees on. Now, if you Google um, various news sources uh, over the last month or so, you will discover that Costa Rica has already secured funding to increase its preserved area from 25% to 26%. So that process is already underway. They are preserving more land and there's less land available to develop. So Costa Rica represents a good opportunity for land investment generally. And of course, when it comes to land investment, there are three things to consider. Location, 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 and we're going to discuss that in due course. But what if we kind of combine the land investment in a great location in Costa Rica with a very valuable commodity that's increasing in price daily and which the International Energy Agency's 2010 World Energy Assessment estimates that supply needs to increase by 400% over the next 20 years? Well, let's talk a little bit about that. And today, um, we're going to welcome Michael Klein. Uh, now, Michael is available just on a, uh, our recording uh, to talk uh, us through the uh, renewable energy opportunity in Costa Rica, the renewable energy farm in the southern zone in Costa Rica. Now, a uh, little bit of background on UBA. They have just uh, been um, selected as one of the top 25 global energy entrepreneurs in the world by Shell Oil. Talk a little bit about um, we're going to talk a little bit about you. We're going to talk a little bit about UBA's background in this new industry. Uh, we're going to be speaking um, a little bit about uh, biofuel, what it is, how it works, and why it's become such a, a great investment in terms of uh, energy, the energy sector. We're going to talk about uh, income land ownership in what we call a hotspot and what a hotspot actually is, and that how combining these factors make a very, very strong investment. The name of our program is Renewable Energy Farms, and UBA is the first biofuel consultancy and development organization in Costa Rica. We've been working um, in field region planning with different governmental bodies uh, throughout Central America, not just Costa Rica, we are based in Costa Rica. We've been primarily focused, uh, apart from this past year and a half, uh, prior to that over four years, we've been focused on commercialization and deployment in 
more for the macro or large investor. Um, we've had four and a half years of uh, R&D, and most of that R&D is in uh, best practices uh, in agronomics. Some of our awards and partners and consortium members, um, Earth University, Venice University uh, in Central America. Most of our agronomic teams are either teachers at the Earth University or have graduated from Earth University. Uh, Ministry of Agriculture, or MAG as they call it, uh, we've been working with them for four years, and they actually sit on our advisory board. Uh, as James mentioned, Shell has recently voted us in the top 25 energy entrepreneurs uh, in the world. Recolte is our national fuel system uh, here in Costa Rica. And this is an important fact. They, they have recently just privatized their biofuel requirements. They have a strong biofuel requirement just in the next couple of years, by 2012, uh, for a 10% blend. And they've been mandated by the government to uh, purchase every gallon of oil grown in Costa Rica. They have been mandated to, uh, to purchase this. International Energy Advisors and Costa Rica Investors voted us uh, Best Investment in Costa Rica. Costa Rica News um, has, uh, you can see us on Costa Rica News in several articles. They voted us Best Green Company in Costa Rica. And we work with Baker, one of the strongest real estate uh, uh, consultancy organizations in Costa Rica. One of our big events is the uh, Chitofa Harvest Experience, it's something that we put on uh, every year. This will be our third one uh, in May. 2011 that we're going to have in Colombia. It's a unique uh, uh, event in that it brings together various people from the uh, biofuel sectors. And we don't just uh, have the conference day, but we actually bring people out to a plantation and walk them through the entire Tatofa process. It's generally a three-day event where we have meet and greet parties, we have a full conference day, we have a full day on the farm, and then we have several um, a smaller event going on. Next year, like I mentioned, May 25th to the 28th uh, in 2011, it's going to be in Santa Marta, Colombia. Beautiful area, beautiful resort. Uh, we're working with partners down there that are um, developing over 30,000 hectares. We're going to have, again, the meet and greet full conference day, plantation tours, the UBA breakfast from various investors, net events. We're going to be doing an event on this particular topic, uh, renewable energy farms and renewable dinners. And essentially is to promote and facilitate biofuel development investment throughout the region of Central America. It's to bring together investors, developers, landowners, technologists, researchers, governmental and ed educational organizations to promote what we call the Million Gallon Challenge. The Million Gallon Challenge came about uh, a couple years ago uh, when we were approached by United States Department of Defense uh, contractors that were developing a technology to convert petrofa biofuel or biofuels into JP8 or jet fuel. And their requirements were a million gallons a day. So we began a very intensive program, uh, research program, to be able to supply them with the million gallons requirements. Um, out of that, we came up with the million gallon challenge and we've been promoting that through our harvest experiences. We already have 80,000 hectares pledged in. Uh, we work, we develop strategic partnerships, uh, micro-investors, macro-investors, renewable energy farms. We realized a number of things was we were developing this program that we can't just um, rely on macro-investment, that we have to approach the micro-investors. And hence, we came up with this program. While we were developing the Million Gallon Challenge, you know, we, we came across some important information. There's an extreme supply and demand gap. We would get, and we still get, daily requests for 40 metric tons per month of oil, or 25 metric tons, or 10 metric tons, from various refineries and organizations all over the world. And quite simply, we were unable to supply them with that. We simply don't have enough plants in the ground. And the supply and demand is continuing to grow because this is a mandated product. So more and more people are, by law, have to uh, involve themselves in biofuels and supplement their fuel system with biofuels, but there's simply not enough plants in the ground. So we always have to tell the macro investors that they have to guarantee their own supply because it's cheaper, otherwise they remain on the bid market, and it's going to become more and more difficult in the future. But anytime you have a supply and demand ratio that's so extreme with a mandated product, essentially this means that you're always going to have end buyers and the profits are going to be very, very high. The solution that 
you know, the solution is quite simple. We simply need more plants in the ground, as many biofuel or oil-bearing plants as possible. We need to engage micro and macro investors, and we have to look at different ways of commercial developments, intercropping cooperatives. We have to plant as many, many trees as we absolutely can that produce biofuels. So renewable energy farms is one of our solutions that meet all these uh, all this criteria. This is a typical Detrofa plantation. I'll talk a little bit more about Detrofa and what Detrofa is in a few minutes. Uh, it's an agrarian parcel. Um, grows in the tropics very, very, very well. The plantation itself uh, are broken up into parcels. The parcels are, uh, we include uh, land, I mean the, the, uh, the roads, the water, and the electricity. These are the investment highlights of the renewable energy farms that we're going to be talking about. There's a low break-in investment of 35000 for the micro-investor. A micro-investor we call someone that's investing somewhere between 30000 and $350,000. Typically, um, we have been dealing with commercial uh, deployments, large-scale deployments, and we were getting an extreme, as we were developing the Million Gallon Challenge, we got an extreme number of calls from what we call micro-investors saying, look, I have $30,000, I want to invest in biofuels, or I have $50,000, I want to invest in biofuels, what can I do? And we didn't have a solution because all of our developments were, were commercial. So on one hand, we have an extreme supply and demand ratio. On the other hand, we have an extreme number of micro-investors that were looking to invest in something other than just the stock market. So renewable energy farms is a low break-in investment of $35,000. It, has, uh, it includes 5,000 square uh, meters of titled property in a Costa Rica growth market. It's a fully managed plantation of 800 income producing trees. The biofuel income over the investment term is almost $50,000. That's the returns that the owner gets on his, uh, on his agrarian parcel. And the property valuation is going to rise uh, in uh, a large way over the next number of years. We're going to look at some of those factors. Essentially, these these parcels are producing 30, on an average, 38% annual return on investment. These are green oil fields producing high quality crude vegetable oils. And we intercrop two uh, main um, biofuel bearing plants. One is Tetropa and one is Maca palm for maximum ROI. These are proven feedstocks. We only grow proven feedstocks. There are a number of them out that we've been working with, but this particular these two particular ones um, have been proven very high yielding and profitable. Uh, Tetrofa, for example, has been selected by the United States Department of Defense as number one drop in replacement for fuel. And since then, uh, we've had a number of aviation uh, companies flying with biofuels. As a matter of fact, next year, uh, if flights flying into Europe are not using biofuel blends, they're going to be taxed. So this is, again, a mandated market. Tetrofa is good because it produces starts producing in the first year. Doing nothing to the plantation, it can produce up to 1,200 gallons per hectare. It has a very high, of over 40% oil content. Very importantly, it's not a food crop. It does not compete with the food crop as, as for example, corn does for ethanol production. And it outperforms other feedstocks on return on investment and net energy. Macaluba is a very interesting palm. Uh, it has multiple types of oil that are all in demand. It's very easy to grow. It's native here to Costa Rica. It can produce up, up to 4,200 gallons per hectare, very high oil con six, uh, content of 60% or more, easily into crop, and it's already grown here. It's a proven product uh, in Costa Rica. But I just want to step back about 100 years, if I can, for a minute. Uh, an interesting fact, this is my least colorful slide, but probably one of my most favorite. <clears throat> Rudolf Diesel, over 100 years ago, in 1893, created the diesel engine. And he created that engine to run on biofuels, on peanut oil specifically. Now, I believe it was 1912 he actually presented this at a World Expo to the World. And a very interesting quote that he came up after that that I've always liked. He said that the use of vegetable oils for engine fuels may seem insignificant today, but such oils may become, in the course of time, as important as petroleum. And here we are now, 100 years later, with uh, various mandates and protocols all around the world grow biofuels, that we need to look at biofuels, and we need to look at it very, very quickly. And there's a number of reasons for that. Fossil fuel and biofuel prices will continue to rise dramatically over the coming decade. And people like Goldman Sachs and analysts, they project 
quite large increases. As a matter of fact, I checked the oil prices this morning and it was still over $90, $90 a barrel. And there's a number of reasons why fossil fuel prices are going to continue to rise. First of all, uh, what they call peak oil. Peak oil is where our supply goes into terminal decline. And most experts agree that this decade we have already reached peak oil, which means that from this point on, our supplies are slowly going to decline uh, to zero at some point. Uh, there's rising upstream and downstream costs. It costs us more every, every year, every month, every day to drill the oil, to transport the oil, to refine the oil, to put the oil in the ponds. It's costing more and more every day. Developing countries like China and India, we made a, we did predict this, uh, experts predicted this over 10 years ago, and they said that by 2015, China was going to overtake the United States in terms of energy consumption. Well, they were right. They were just wrong on the, on the year. Um, earlier this year, China is the number one energy consumer in the world. India is fast rising up behind them. So we have uh, these developing countries, as well as many other ones, that have come onto the market rapidly and are continuing to grow at an exponential rate. Of course, driving fossil fuel prices up, which is why Goldman and Sachs predicts $100 a barrel in 2011, and over the next decade, predicting $350 uh, a barrel. But why is biofuels going to rise? Well, that's interesting because essentially it's been globally mandated. We have 127 countries around the world that have already mandated biofuel development. Uh, we have aviation industry that's mandated biofuel development or biofuel use. As a matter of fact, the avi aviation industry consumes 16 billion gallons per year. And like I mentioned earlier, they are going to be taxed, like in Europe, uh, if they don't have biofuel blend. The same with the transportation uh, industry. They have been mandated. Uh, we have protocols like the Kyoto Protocol, which has been moved over to Camp Copenhagen and Cancun. These are driving further and further uh, standards to be developed for biofuel development. And of course, as James mentioned, Costa Rica has the National Biofuel Program. They, they, have, uh, they have a carbon neutrality goal of 2021, and they have a 10% blend requirement by 2012. They've just recently this year, earlier this year, privatized biofuels. Essentially, that means that they've been uh, ordered by the government that every gallon of biofuel that's grown in this country has to be purchased at fair market value. So we're going to see unprecedented growth over the next coming decade of biofuels. So we went to our advisory board and we said to them, look, on one hand, we have an extreme supply demand gap. Uh, we do not have enough plants. The macro developers are not growing fast enough uh, rate because obviously larger development take a longer time to develop. And we have, on the other hand, we have an extreme number of micro investors that are looking to uh, invest, and we need the trees in the ground to come up with a solution. We gave them some parameters. It has to be for the micro investor. It has to meet national biofuel program demands. It has to be sustainable, of course. It has to have a low entry point of $35,000. The investor has to have the security of titled real estate. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity out there in biofuel investment where you're uh, simply putting dollars into a fund, but um, you don't actually have title ownership of anything. Uh, so this is a very important point for us to be able to offer to investors title uh, real estate security that, that also has exceptional appreciation potential. The other factor that we told our team was, look, the solution has to um, pay for itself within a 10-year period or more, I mean, or less, through the biofuel income. And the combined return on investment must be 300% over the term of the uh, uh, So they came up with renewable energy farms in what we call hotspots. We sent our teams out to find hotspots. A hotspot is uh, a piece of property or land or an area that is going to see rapid proven development uh, growth over the next five to ten years. And, of course, it has to be ideal growing conditions uh, for biofuels. So this is what we call hotspots. Uh, this particular map here is only showing two hotspots. We are going to be talking about renewable energy farms, but there's actually been about four or five identified throughout the uh, region. What makes this uh, particular area probably the most interesting in Costa Rica right now in terms of investment over the next 10 years is of several factors. This is called the Buenos Aires Canton, or, or, or county, I guess you translate Canton. 
And the entire southern zone has not seen the development as the way West of Costa Rica has. So they're considering it the next market sector, growth market sector in Costa Rica. Now, you look at some of the factors for the southern zone. Very interesting uh, in terms of land values. First of all, the uh, third international airport is just been approved last year, this year, uh, for Pomasur. Now let me just uh, back this up for one second. And you, can see, you can see on the map here, Pomasur is just a few minutes away from our unit, about 40, 30 to 45 minutes, depending, uh, from the renewable energy farms. And we have a track record on the, what happens when a new international airport comes in. Uh, we had one international airport, it's uh, San Jose Airport, here in the Central Valley. And it became overloaded, so they developed a airport in the northern region called Liberia. Now, what happened in that region, uh, as soon as the airport was starting to be built, that land prices quadrupled over the next couple of years, simply because of the infrastructure. And this particular one is very exciting for us because it's the third international airport, and we already know the track record of what happens when an airport goes in. And we're only going to be 45 minutes from the new airport. The other important point is that there is the second largest infrastructure project in all of Central America going into this valley uh, in the southern zone. And it's a hydroelectric dam that's going to feed uh, regions both north and south in Central America. And it's number two in all of Central America in terms of uh, largest infrastructure project, second only to the Panama Canal. Another important point is that this area is considered the best agriculture area in Costa Rica. And we already have the Tofa and the Macauba palm achieving yields. It's also only one hour from Golfito and the Panama border. Golfito is a very large free zone. Uh, it's, uh, and it's a beautiful area on the Osa Peninsula. Osa Peninsula hosts the Corcovado Park, the largest uh, biological reserve in Central America. And you're less than an hour away from some of the best beaches in Central America. Some of them have been rated in the top ten in the world. This picture I, I had to put in just before I began the, the renewable energy farms uh, part. Uh, this actually is a river. I'm a river fisherman from way back in Canada. And I was on this, uh, I was down on the renewable energy farms earlier this year. And this is a river that's running directly through the property. Uh, beautiful, beautiful river. And I just had to throw this picture in because it's one of my favorites. This is the master plan of the renewable energy farms. Of the limited uh, launch, as uh, as James mentioned, it's, uh, we had eight. Uh, parcels, and now I believe we only have four, I think four already reserved, um, of the renewable energy farms in Buenos Aires. The investment parameters, the type of asset, of course, it's biofuel producing to Trofa and Macaluga Palm. The investment is annual revenue as well as land appreciation growth. The tenure is uh, 10 years. Uh, that is optional. We'll talk a little bit about that. Your protection or your security is that this is titled land in Costa Rica in your name. The property size is a minimum of 5,000 square meters, and the investment starts at $35,000 for one person. Now let's take a look at the revenue forecast and why this is such a, a, a strong investment. You'll see in the biofuel uh, income column that Jatropha starts producing in the first year and continues to produce for the next uh, 50 years, actually, for as long as you decide to have biofuel plantation. Um, at years 5 through 10, this is when our palm uh, uh, part kicks in. In other words, palm, the Macaluba palm takes five years for it to start producing. While it's growing to its uh, production phase, the Jatropha is already producing income and will continue also to produce income in that second uh, 5 to 10 year period. So a very important point here is that you see that the biofuel income total is $49,875, approximately $50,000 of income over the next 10 years. Now, these prices, this revenue reflects no increase in biofuel prices over term. Now, we've already talked about the increasing costs of, uh, of biofuels and why it's going to go up over the next uh, several decades. But I have not included any increase. I'm using today's current prices. Uh, of biofuel. Now, last year, the price of uh, crude biofuel oil uh, for Jatropha was uh, $2 a gallon. And in the last year, it's risen 50 cents. So 
So even if it rises another 50 cents, uh, that takes that total, that $49,000 total, would rise it over $60,000. But I have not reflected any increase in prices. Now, what we, of course, what I really like about this, apart from the biofuel, is the property valuation. This particular area, because of the infrastructure, because of the airport, uh, because of the large hydroelectric dam, is going to see dramatic growth over the next uh, 10 years. Once we put in your $35,000 investment, we plant the trees, we put in roads, electricity, and water to each of the lots. Instantly, when we put that in, traditionally in Costa Rica, it doubles the value of the land. Hence, after year one, we have the $70,000 valuation. Now, our experts at Day Group have come back with a 7.5% uh, increase appreciation rate uh, yearly for the next few years, up until year five. And that's a little bit higher than, than uh, the average uh, price in Costa Rica, uh, which is usually about 56 uh, but they feel that this particular area, because of the airport, is going to see significant growth. And then once the first phase of the airport is done and the second and third phases begin in years 5 through 10, they're predicting that the values of, of land are going to rise to 10% per year, giving $154,000 uh, in terms of land appreciation of land value after 10 years. So this is a, a very strong investment in terms of its ROI at 38.2% uh, average in years. Now one important point I want to mention here is um, we've been talking with a lot of micro investors over the last couple of years and we survey them, we question them, they've come into our various uh, micro investment programs in renewable energy farms. But we were getting a lot of questions because typically people were coming down to Central America, specifically Costa Rica, and they were investing in a condo investment. They were looking for income producing property and at that time uh, the only option, essentially, was to buy a condo and try to rent it out over the next number of years until they were ready to retire in 10 or 15 years. And that was uh, that was essentially their uh, income uh, property investment. So we've had a lot of questions. Of, well, how do you compare renewable energy farms, uh, farms versus a condo investment? So we drew up this slide just to kind of give a quick synopsis of the comparison. You'll see that... Um, on the renewable energy farm side, for 175,000, you can actually purchase five lots. Compare that to uh, the average condo investment in the area, which was uh, or on the coast, which is 220,000 dollars. The land value in 10 years on those five lots is projected to be worth 770,000 dollars, and the land value on one condo is projected to be. $500,000, so a significant difference there. And notice the question marks, and I asked our experts, I said, why did they got the question marks there? And they said, well, we don't know what the value of that condo is going to be in five years. If they put up five more condos around you, there's going to be more condos for sale and for rent. That's going to drive your prices actually down. The total income on the renewable energy farms is almost a quarter of a million dollars, as opposed to the condo, which was $50,000. And again, the question marks, and they said, well, we base this number on the fact that you're going to have to rent this condo two and a half times a month regularly, consistently over the next 10 years uh, in a fairly competitive market. There's a lot of condos out there for rent. So you would have to consistently do that two times a month every year for the next 10 years to come up with $50,000. Total value of your five lots compared to the condo? is over a million dollars. Total value, questionable, on the condo is uh, $550,000. But what do you get with your five lots? Well, you, you have ownership. You own the land. You have title property in a high growth area. It gives you more flexibility in that you can liquidate a lot whenever you need. When you need cash, if you wanted to build a house, you can build a house. If you need cash and you want to sell one or two lots, you can do that. You can sell a lot to pay for the cost of building your home on another lot and keep the rest in the biofuel pool program. But most importantly is you get five title pieces of property that's approximately that is uh, six point a uh, little over six acres. As opposed to the condo, you have one condo. Uh, at the end of ten years, of course, you have a ten year old condo. And then you have all the costs that go in plus you have the questionability question of uh, whether or not you'll be able to rent that two times every month uh, consistently over the next ten years. And of course over ten years you're going to have to replace appliances, ongoing maintenance, anything, etc. So uh, we had a lot of questions on this, and uh, you know when you do take a look at the comparison.
comparison here to us and that's a no comparison. Now one of the points I mentioned was, was flexibility. And that's very important in investment. That was one of our parameters when we asked our team to come up with the renewable energy farms uh, program last year. One of the criteria was it had to be not only secure and pay for itself over 10 years and have to own have security of title property, but it had to be very, very flexible. And what I mean by that is, is that it gives the owner, the investor, as much flexibility as possible in terms of what they want to do, when they want to do, uh, what they want to build, if they want to sell with their property. So uh, you can opt out of the biofuel program anytime you like. Um, it, is, it is an opt-in program. Um, so if you decided you want to sell or you decided you want to build, you can opt out of that program anytime you like. If you decided to opt, you can opt out of the program and you can um, run your own house off the grid because you can simply run your house, your generator, uh, with the biofuel that's on your property. You can build your own house at any time, but it's quite a large property. It's 5,000 square meters. Uh, you can cut a small piece in. And it's a beautiful plantation, as you saw earlier in the pictures, that uh, it's very beautiful to look at, just like you're living in a tropical orchard. Um, and you can stay in the biofuel program and build your house. You can stay in the biofuel, uh, go out of the biofuel program and uh, build your house, or you can sell one, two, three, or four, however many lots uh, that you would like. We made it very simple in terms of steps. Uh, you need to reserve your renewable energy farm investment parcel. Uh, you would receive a package that you would have to fill out. Uh, you would then receive uh, uh, your Green Oil Field National Biofuel Certificate, which is something that you need to hang on to because uh, something we haven't talked about is uh, reforestation credits and carbon credits, which are coming online very fast over the next couple of years. And this biofuel, uh, National Biofuel Program Certificate, qualify you for that. And of course you'd be able to see your uh, your investment in the National Registry and you'd begin earning income uh, immediately in the first so Let me summarize uh, of the investment highlights. It's a low break-in investment of $35,000. It's 5,000 square meter, meter title property security because it's title property in a coastal growth market. We fully manage uh, plantation. In other words, we plant we harvest, we clean your properties, we keep them clean every year. We plant, we prune, we manage the plantation, we put in drip irrigation when we need it uh, to make sure that the plants are, are producing the maximum yield. Uh, we harvest, uh, we process, and we sell your product, and we return 100% less management fees of the biofuel pro uh, proceeds to you. Management fees is 10%. Uh, so essentially, you're getting almost 100% of the biofuel proceeds over the course of the term and it's fully managed. The property will pay for itself, more than pay for itself in 10 years, 49000 plus, at today's prices. Like I mentioned, I'm not putting in any increase in prices, which we know it will go up. And the property valuation over investment term is almost $120,000. It's located in Costa Rica's, one of Costa Rica's primary hotspots in terms of uh, real estate development and growth. Gives you maximum flexibility. It combines two growth markets, both renewable energies and high growth real estate areas. And your sales are guaranteed. It's a mandated market. Of course, the government has mandated it. Uh, and as well, we have several other end buyers that uh, are essentially, we have them lining up at our door, like I mentioned. We do not have enough plants in the And all of these combined are going to return approximately 38% annual. And this is what makes this a smart, ethical, and profitable investment. I just wanted to share as I wrap up here and begin to hand control back over uh, over to James uh, some of the pictures from the area. This is uh, very close uh, to the Renewable Energy Farms. These pictures were all taken. It's a beautiful, beautiful area. I mentioned Port Cabado Park is there, one of the biggest biological reserves. Exceptionally beautiful uh, agriculture land that uh, <coughs> the mountains are surrounded by uh, animals. Well, interesting thing James mentioned is that Costa Rica has 5% of the world's biodiversity uh, in a, such a small, small country like Nova Scotia, Canada, having 5% of the world's biodiversity. Um, you, you cannot go for even in a city, when you're walking in the city, you see wildlife everywhere. It is, it's very, truly a, a beautiful, beautiful country. Beautiful animals, beautiful area. Um, some of the beaches are absolutely uh, phenomenal. Uh, some of them are great on the Pacific Coast in the top, like I mentioned, the top 10 of the world. Stunning scenery.
of my favorite places in the world. <laughs> so from Costa Rica, I'd like to thank you all very much. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, if any of you can you know, if you can contact us, if you look and watch your presentation again, I'd be more than happy to do that uh, through a private presentation. Uh, you can contact me through James. And uh, with that said, I would like to hand control back over to uh, James. Okay, everybody, we'll just uh, set up our screen again to continue. Great, thank you very much for that, Michael. And uh, uh, again, we'll just set up our screen to uh, get ourselves uh, set up here. Um, apologies for the slight delay. But we will get our next screen set up. Okay. So. Okay. So, what have we got here? Well, we've Costa Rica, which as a country represents a great opportunity. Uh, we have development land in Costa Rica, and that re represents a tremendous investment opportunity. Because of the reducing supply, as Costa Rica uh, zones more land as national park and forest reserves and plants more trees, we've got increasing demand uh, from those retiring baby boomers. And we have biofuels. Now, I mentioned on the screen that we have uh, eight lots uh, available at uh, 35,000. In fact, those lots are already uh, reserved. Um, but uh, I'm glad to say that we do have some other, other lots available. And uh, so uh, I did mention that uh, there's a special offer for those of you attending uh, this evening. And the special offer is this, uh, that each of the lots that you invest in will be registered in its own Costa Rican SA or limited company. And there are tax and management advantages to this. If you own land or property in Costa Rica, as a general rule, you should hold it in a Costa Rican SA or limited company. And uh, Daniel Yepes, the president of UBA, has agreed to pick up the cost of this. Now, normally the cost of this is, is uh, to the investor, and that would cost you probably somewhere in the region of 500 to 750 US dollars. And this is included in these lots. The second thing that's included in these lots is that um, for every investor who invests in one lot, you will get a free uh, ticket uh, to uh, one of the Jatrofa Harvest experiences, and that is either in Colombia in May of this year or later in the year in uh, September in Costa Rica, and you can take your choice as to which one you attend. So those tickets uh, are worth 1500 US dollars each and each investor uh, gets one of those. So to register your interest in these lots, if you're seriously interested in Costa Rica, in land in Costa Rica, in biofuels, and in a great investment, to register your interest, just send an email to info at costaricainvest.ie. Please include your name, your phone number, and the number of lots that you're interested in, just the general number of lots that you're inter interested in. Uh, and if you are interested in this opportunity, I strongly advise you to open up your email box now and uh, send us an email and get on that list to register your interest. So, everybody, thank you very much for attending our webinar and uh, have a great evening. <laughs>